So, a wonderful good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on wherever you are. And welcome to yet another talk in the Back to Basics track. So the Back to Basics track is supposed to bring comprehensible, easy to understand talks. Um, and this one is no exception, as it is about exceptions. So allow me to, first of all, introduce myself. My name is Klaus. I'm doing uh, C++ trainings for a living since approximately 2016. And apparently this is not even enough C++ for me. I'm also the author of a C++ smart library called Blaze, and I'm one of the organizers of the Munich C++ user group, which, by the way, since now everything has turned into virtual, um, may be a pretty interesting uh, point anyway. Um, Munich seems to be one of the um, most attractive, most active user groups worldwide. And since it's kind of in the middle uh, of a lot of potential countries, a lot of people can join. So please check out the Music C++ user group. There might be a lot of content interesting for you. However, back to topic. Today we are talking about exceptions. And I want to start with the exception situation, because I believe this is actually one of the most important, most interesting um, things to talk to about um, when you talk about exceptions. Then we do a short recap. We talk about how do exceptions work. And then we focus in depth on how to work with exceptions. So best practices of exceptions handling. And we'll go into a lot of details here. Well, let's get started with the exception situation. And you indeed might wonder, there is recently a lot of talks about exceptions. For instance, right in the uh, time slot after this talk, there is a talk about exceptions. And you might also remember that last year at CPCon 2019, there was a talk about exceptions also. There is probably a reason that exceptions are pretty uh, on vogue nowadays. And it probably all started with a, a paper uh, from 2018. Zero overhead deterministic exceptions throwing values. Herb Sutter uh, proposed this in 2018. This is the um, fourth revision, therefore 2019. And there's a couple of pretty interesting points that he makes. So I scroll down a little bit and go to a couple of um, bullet points. Major coding guidelines ban exceptions, including common modern guidelines endorsed by the world's top advocates of C++ exceptions. For example, the Google C++ style guides bans exceptions. The Joint Strike Fighter Air Vehicle C++ coding standards, or short JSF++, was produced by a group that included Björn Strustrup and is published on Strustrup's personal webpage and bans exceptions. Many projects ban exceptions. In some survey in 2018, 52% of C++ developers reported that exceptions were banned in part or all of their project code, i.e. most are not allowed to freely use C++'s primary recommended error handling model that is required to use the C++ standard language and library. So as kind of an in-between summary, this is an intolerable rift. Large numbers of C++ projects are not actually using standard C++. And that is indeed the situation. A lot of people cannot use them, do not want to use them for various reasons. And that despite the fact that exceptions are actually rated pretty, a pretty decent way to report errors, or to propagate errors. For instance, in 2018, Phil Nash and Simon Brandt um, compared different ways to deal with errors. And it pretty much compared everything that is available, return codes, but also um, they are flagging also a couple of things, but also, of course, exceptions. And they rated them based on these eight categories and found that, after all, exceptions are not totally bad. There is a couple of things where they really shine. However, there is, of course, also a couple of things where exceptions do not shine. One of the most obvious things here is the rating of one uh, for overhead in the error path. That definitely is one of the things that people do not like about exceptions. Exceptions incur an extreme performance overhead in the failure case. And to give you an idea how big this, um, this performance penalty is, I'm borrowing a slide from um, Neil Douglas's uh, introduction to propose to expected from Meeting C++ 2017. In his talk, he presents this slide, 
which I don't want to go into detail. It's not so interesting what exactly is compared here, but there's a couple of uh, things that apparently have low bars, and there is exceptions, these yellow bars. And the most important detail about this slide, I believe, is the uh, left-hand side uh, um, um, yeah, axis. It is a logarithmic scale. Logarithmic means that exceptions, if they're truly thrown, are orders of magnitude more expensive than anything else. Now, return codes, returning expected things, orders of magnitude more expensive. And of course, this can be a significant problem in uh, many project situations. But this is not it. There's more, unfortunately. There's one point that is always brought up. That is it, that exceptions make it hard to reason about functions. Does a function throw or does it not throw? And if it does throw, what does it throw? So which kind of exception is thrown? That is indeed something that is a little harder to, um, to deal with. There's only one exception that we'll also take a look um, at uh, a little later. Of course, you can declare a function no except, but that's the one exception. I know it will not throw, but about all the other things, I still have to wonder. Something that also deals uh, is a deal breaker for many people is except that exceptions rely on dynamic memory. That indeed can be a deal breaker, especially in the situations where you're not allowed to use dynamic memory. Exceptions need that because, as a matter of fact, sometimes several exceptions might be required. And all of these exceptions might actually uh, have to allocate something of a dynamic size, something that is not known beforehand. That is, of course, uh, uh, something that potentially makes a big problem. And then last but not least, exceptions make the binary size grow. Both common approaches, the so-called frame-based and the so-called table-based approach, um, result in the, uh, uh, an increased binary size. The compiler stores some information somewhere that helps with dispatching um, the right kind of handling. Uh, so it's some kind of um, dispatch tables. Um, where is the right catch handler, for instance? They're not for free, uh, and so they have to be stored somewhere. The binary size grows. So in other words, this is not zero overhead. There is something to pay um, when you use exceptions. However, all of these problems hopefully will go away if indeed there is this major overhaul that is proposed in this paper. I have to um, tell you that this is not the only approach, but now there is a couple of papers um, out there that basically try to figure out what is the right approach. But in other words, there is happening something. Something is on the horizon. And if all of the things work out as anticipated, then potentially, and this is one of the last messages that was given in the already mentioned talk, exceptions could actually become something that is very, very good. You know, almost flawless in terms of these numbers here. So, of course, this is a pretty hot topic nowadays and something that um, stirs a lot of interest because suddenly, on the horizon, exceptions might actually be something that in all those projects that today cannot use them um, might be able to use. So, our ultimate goal is to make exceptions usable for everyone. This is one part of the story. The technical thing, making exceptions useful for everyone technically, this is something that you will hear about a little more in the talk directly after this slot. So um, in the next time slot, Inva Levy will talk about exceptions under the spotlight. This talk is more about teaching how to work with exceptions properly and implicitly how to just write good code. Because ultimately, this is what um, exceptions teach us. Good code works pretty well with exceptions other code does not. And so perhaps for this talk, I want to actually try something. Perhaps I, it works out, perhaps it does not. Because it appears that this is a talk for two different kinds of communities. The community that can use exceptions and the other part of the community, almost half-half, um, that cannot use exceptions. For this talk, I will try to perhaps bring these two communities together. And primarily, I want to focus on how to write good code that can also deal with exceptions well, but um, of course, is also good from a lot of other points of view. 
All right, so let's do a quick recap on how exceptions actually work. And there's a couple of uh, important um, things to, uh, that you sh should always keep in mind. The first thing is that exceptions usually have to do with three keywords, and that is throw, which is here, for instance, try and catch. So in this little example, I have a function f that may have some local variables, and that under some condition throws an exception. This function f is called from some function g that also might have some local state, um, and which is ultimately called by main function, which embeds this call and try catch block. So one thing that is pretty obvious is the throw and catch are pretty far away from each other. At some point, you actually find something wrong, report this error, and at some completely different point, potentially pretty far away, you actually deal with this particular problem which may be actually a beauty about exceptions. You do not see something in between. Uh, in between, it is just as if everything would work out. Uh, so here in G, I just call a function and I just rely on the fact that things are handled. Because in if, in fact, an exception is thrown, then something pretty good happens, something called stack unwinding. Function F has some local state, the string S. And the first thing that happens is that this S is properly destroyed by its own destructor before I go back to the actual call site. The function G also has some local state, the vector V, which is then destroyed next before I again go to the actual call site. So note, objects are destroyed in reverse order of the construction naturally because this is um, exactly what, what needs to happen if I basically jump up uh, or go up the call stack. Then finally, in the try catch block, the exception is caught and handled. However, the stack unwinding is not something that you can take for granted. If you would omit the try catch block, then nothing keeps the exception, nothing catches the exception, the exception would leave the main function. In case that happens, the exception is not handled and no stack unwinding occurs. On the contrary, a function called to terminate is called, and to terminate is a function that is not particularly pleasant. It basically just terminates your process, and as I said, a lot of things do not happen, no stack unwinding, no destructors are called, and so resources are potentially leaked. So it is definitely reasonable to at least catch exceptions somehow, and if you don't want to react to, to them in any way, a so-called catch-all handler might do the trick. A catch-all handler is just about catching anything. You cannot deal with this very specifically at this point, but at least you um, guarantee that the stack is probably unwound. So at this time, you might already have a couple of questions. Since there is directly after this talk a uh, subsequent AMA session, I will take all the questions at, uh, at the end. So if you have a couple of questions, please write them down and do not forget to use the slide numbers. This definitely helps in finding the right slide again. Which brings us to the biggest part in this talk, best practices of exception handling. And the first question that people usually deal with is when should I use exceptions and or not? Of course, assuming that you're allowed to use exceptions in the first place. So, to summarize, use exceptions for errors that are expected to occur rarely. You've just seen that in the error case, uh, the performance penalty is pretty high. So, I would not use exceptions for something that occurs pretty often. Use exceptions for the cases that are truly exceptional, that occur rarely, um, and probably also in which cases you do not really care about performance anymore. Uh, the really, the real problems. Then use them for the exceptional cases that you cannot deal with locally. So for instance, uh, cases like file not found. You have no idea what to do if a specific file is not found. Probably you have to communicate this upwards um, to a point where you can uh, go to some backup strategy. Or you cannot find a key in a map, although this was, some, was something that you were absolutely expecting. Then use exceptions for operators and constructors. Operators, for instance, like operator plus, operator minus, so the things that have a natural return value, and it does not really allow you to return anything else. 
Constructors, on the other side, cannot return anything. And so this is two examples where it's quite natural to use exceptions. They provide a different uh, exit point from these functions, and so you do not have, uh, don't need any kind of return value. Now, of course, if you cannot use exceptions, this is usually a problem. Yeah? Operators, constructors, they usually pose a problem. There may be solutions to that also. For that case, in case you're interested to deal with constructors in a convenient way, I will refer you to this uh, short lightning talk, fixing two-phase initialization. Uh, two-phase initialization is what is usually done in that case. But if you do it right, you actually can cope with the problem pretty nicely, pretty naturally. However, you should not use exceptions for errors that are expected to occur frequently. So if indeed something um, yeah, it happens very, very often, perhaps there's a better way to report um, that something happened. That may, for instance, be for functions that are expected to fail. So for instance, a function that is supposed to convert a string into an int. Let's call this function to int. It gets a string as a parameter. It is kind of expected that the string here cannot be converted. So perhaps this is an example where I simply do not throw an exception to notify the user that something went wrong, but to perhaps return an optional. In the case that something didn't work, the optional is returned as a no-opt, else um, you just return the according number. That's quite natural. Although, of course, an optional does not really express some bad thing happened. For this reason, stood expected was proposed, which is a little closer to the actual thing. Either you get an int or something that represents an error. So it's a little closer, a little more specific, but unfortunately, stood expected was not um, uh, standardized yet, so it's not part of C20. Um, perhaps uh, an alternative is to rely on the original, the boost outcome, which is kind of the predecessor of standard expected. So if you write this function like that, it's, I believe, a little easier to, to comprehend because it does not, uh, the function does not pretend that all strings can be converted into an int. It's a little easier to deal with this. Then don't use exceptions if you indeed have to guarantee certain response times, even in the error case. In that case, exceptions are truly a bad thing to work with because unfortunately this, this response time, it feels a little bit unbounded. Of course, you might measure explicitly, and find that, that it still works, but I would argue there is a certain risk. This is exactly one of the things that needs to be repaired. Um, it's mostly about the implementation of the compilers. And so there can be something done. It just might take a little time. And last but not least, do not use exceptions for things that should never happen, like dereferencing null pointers, out of range access, use of the free. This is not exceptions, errors, this is bugs. Bugs that you should fix. Um, this is something that you might uh, simply report when assert, uh, crash right away, and it should be fixed before it goes to the customer. Um, or of course, um, you, you find other ways to deal with this. Uh, this is not exceptional cases, this is just plain bugs. All right, again, note down your questions. I will take all of them in the end, um, so please keep them coming. Let's deal with how to use exceptions properly. And there's a couple of reasonable um, common advice that you get when you deal with exceptions. The first thing is that you should build on the already existing hierarchy in a standard library, the exception hierarchy. Standard exception is designed as a base class. And this slide is something that you don't have to read, just should give you a feeling of there is already quite a lot of possibilities that you have. So std exception is in the center, and this is a base class for, for instance, logic error and runtime error, which on their own are, again, base classes to a lot of much more specific errors. I believe you will find a spot where your particular, your special kind of exception fits in quite well, and so you can build on this exception hierarchy. Standard exception is also the one base class in the standard library that you need to know. Everything else is probably something that you will only in rare cases visit, but this is the one base class that is indeed interesting, that you are supposed to inherit from. 
then throw by R value, which means you can throw arbitrary things. You can even throw pointers. Um, you can even throw reference references, but this is not a particularly good idea. The good recent convention is that you throw something directly by value. In this case, I'm doing that. I'm creating a runtime error, which could even be const. I give it some message and I throw it. But why give it a name? There's not a lot of point. Perhaps there are special cases, but in this particular case, the common advice is just to throw the thing directly. Throw std runtime error. So I do not throw something that has a name. I do throw something that does not have a name. That would be an R value. And that, of course, enables the compiler to, um, to deal with this a little more efficiently. Although, as we've seen before, the performance of throw might be so bad that you do not really benefit from this particular um, uh, optimization. But still, it's reasonable advice. And last but not least, catch by reference. You can catch by a lot of things. You can, for instance, also catch by value. To some extent, the catch class works indeed like functions argument do. In this case, I now catch by value, get something by value. But as if we've seen is that standard exception is a base class. And of course, there is a couple of disadvantages if you catch a base class by value. First, creates an unnecessary copy, which since it's the base class might not be too bad, but definitely bad is that it now slices the type of exception. The real thing, whether it's a runtime error or a logic error or something else, is lost. And so therefore, the common device is to catch by reference. Usually reference to const if you do not want to modify except the exception, but if you want to, well, of course, you can also catch by non-const uh, reference, mutate the exception, and then potentially re-throw it again. All right, which brings us to, to some extent, the core of the talk, writing good code. And first, we should talk about something that is called the exception safety guarantees. And this already sounds a little bit like good things. The name guarantee suggests that there is some promises that we are making. There is, in fact, three different levels of sef uh, exception safety guarantees. The first level of exception safety guarantee is called basic exception safety guarantee. That already is pretty valuable because, first of all, it promises us that invariants are preserved. As invariants are the one and only thing that you can trust, uh, that the one thing that definitely needs to be uh, something that you can count on, this is already pretty valuable. And second, the basic exception safety guarantee promises that no resources are leaked. Also something that is particularly valuable. What this does not promise, however, is that state does not change. So if you call a function that gives this guarantee, let's assume it's a member function, then the state of the object that you call this function on might actually change. Since it promises that invariants are preserved, it is a valid state, but it is not necessarily the original state. If you also want to promise that the original state is preserved, then we need something called the strong exception safety guarantee. That additionally, so it again promises invariants are preserved and no resources are leaked, but it additionally promises that no state is changing. In a database, we would call this a transaction. We also refer to this as commit rollback semantics. That, of course, is absolutely great because this is something that um, really feels easy to use. So I call this function, either it works or nothing has changed. Really beautiful, but unfortunately, it's not always possible. So for instance, uh, imagine that I'm reading something from a socket, this fails, I might not be able to read it again. Same is true for streams. And it might not always be reasonable performance-wise. This is something that we'll see again a little later. Uh, sometimes it could be done, but we just don't want to pay the cost for it. And there is even one more, more guarantee, an even stronger exception safety guarantee, and that one is called a no-throw 
or sometimes also the no-fail guarantee. That guarantee simply says the operation cannot fail. It will not throw an exception. And this is nowadays explicitly expressed in code with no accept, which I'll talk about um, a little later. So this is the three exception safety guarantees. Um, and this is now what we want to apply in code directly. We want to see how code works with uh, these particular exception safety guarantees. So let's consider an example. And as I said, this is not just about exceptions now. I want to really make the point that this is about writing good code. Code that you can reason about, code that works reliably, and that you just have a good feeling about. So whether or not you're using exceptions is indeed irrelevant. You want to write this kind of code. And interestingly, exception safety is just an outcome of writing this kind of code. So to some extent, I'm now building on um, a talk from John Kolb from uh, CPPCon 2014, I believe it was. Um, the talk was also called Exception Safe Code. Um, and in his talk, he starts by making a promise. Actually, it's three parts, and this promise holds for all three parts. The promise is that if you follow the advice, the code is easier to read, which implies it is easier to understand and maintain, and then I'll add that it is even more correct with a much, much higher um, uh, probability than if it would not be. The code becomes easier to write as well, which is, of course, also great. There is no additional time penalty, and it should be 100% robust. You should be able to just trust the code, look at the code, and know it is working correctly. All right. The example that I have is widget class. And this class, first of all, comes with three data members. It comes with an integer, which I, by default, uh, initialize to zero. It comes with a string s that, by default, I initialize to an empty string. And it comes with a pointer to some resource, a raw pointer initialized to null pointer. I should already at this point point out that PR may be null. This is part of the semantics of this widget. So um, if this is null, the invariant might still be preserved. That's OK. One of the things I definitely want to do with a widget is that I want to copy it. And so first of all, I write a copy constructor which is pretty straightforward. So given I have some uh, other widget, I first of all copy the integer, I copy the string, and then, well, I copy um, the resource. And I do not copy just the pointer, which would be bad because copying a raw pointer here would probably um, cause some trouble later in the destructor. No, I'm really copying the resource as such. So I'm creating a new resource, literally, and assign this to the pointer PR. Of course, I'm only doing that if the given pointer, so the pointer inside this W here, is not a null pointer. Else I just um, stick to the null pointer that I also have. So that's a copy constructor. We can take a look at this. And we feel pretty confident that everything we're doing in this function is just OK. Very straightforward. Deal with the int, deal with the string deal with the pointer. Then, however, I also, for symmetry reasons alone, want a copy assignment operator. That, as you see here in, uh, in, with these braces, is apparently a slightly longer story. So I start with something that I used to forget pretty often, and so um, it's nowadays the, the first thing I write, the return statement. Now, the canonical return asterisk this, um, that's the first thing we do. However, from a logic point of view, the first thing is that we do is, of course, we copy the integer. Well, OK. Then we copy the string, also pretty straightforward. And we copy the pointer in the sense that we create a new resource um, that deals with um, this copy operation. So copy construct of resource. OK. You already see that something's missing. I'm missing the check, of course. I also, again, have to deal with uh, null pointers. W.PR could be null. I should check for this first, and then it actually works well. 
However, something still does not feel quite right. Oh yes, of course. What if the given pointer is null? And what about um, the fact that actually I'm assigning to a pointer that might already have been uh, holding a resource? Oh, there's multiple things that we should take care of. So first of all, I definitely should take care of my old resource first. I do not want to leak any kind of memory, so I delete uh, the pointer. And then, of course, I said, potentially, um, the pointer is null, so I need an else branch too. An else branch that um, probably sets PR to null in case um, the other pointer is null. Uh, so I want the, uh, this widget to be a real copy of the other widget. Whew, okay, this was already a lot of work, a lot of details, but something's still missing. And yes, you might already see that a special case is missing, an edge case, self-assignment. If indeed, accidentally, or because it's just a semantical thing, um, this W here is the same as the, this widget, then actually this is not really working well. Now, this might work well, perhaps this does, but I'm definitely destroying my old resource and then it's gone. And this definitely is not what a user would expect if, um, if it assigns a widget to itself. So I should protect myself against this by means of a canonical um, self-assignment protection statement. Okay, now it feels a little bit like we can lean back and be very proud about ourselves that this is actually not working well. You may anticipate, however, that this is not the end of the story. Because this line here gives us a lot of trouble, potentially. New could fail. New could actually throw an exception because it does not, uh, is not able to give you enough memory. If indeed you don't have enough memory, you probably have totally different problems. This may be the one thing that um, you cannot really cope with. But also the construct of resource might throw an exception. And if that happens, we are unfortunately in a pretty bad state because we have already deleted our old resource. And the delete operation frees the memory. This is great. Um, but it does not reset the pointer. So if indeed the construct of resource throws an exception, I have a dangling pointer. And so the invariant of my class is completely destroyed. You would expect that in the destructor, I simply delete this pointer too. Now imagine that in the destructor, I now find a dangling pointer. I would try to delete the resource a second time. Of course, this doesn't work. And perhaps this is more like a silent error if your standard library is not configured accordingly, but perhaps it also crashes. And if you see the crash, it is miles away from the line where actually the problem occurred. And so this is really, really bad. Broken invariant is probably the worst thing that can happen to you. Perhaps I can visualize this even more by um, telling you that this is perhaps a toy example. Consider some real example, some ATM machine. Consider that somebody has written a class bank account and this bank account comes with a withdraw money function. Well, you pass some amount, and the first thing you do is to reduce the balance by this given amount. Okay, now the next thing is that we have to do is we have to prepare the cash that the, the user of the ATM machine uh, then finally gets. What if prepare cash does not really work, throws an exception? Well, then of course I have a significant problem either, because the balance has already been reduced. What is the obvious solution in this case? Well, of course, it is a try-catch block. Try, prepare cache, and in case there's something happening, any exception is thrown, then of course we increase the balance again. Is this really the kind of code that you want uh, to happen behind the covers in an ATM machine? Is this the way you want your money to be treated? Let's admit it, this is just bad code. Code that is not really reliable. Yeah, what if increase balance throws another exception? The money is gone. It might be entirely gone. 
And a lot of people believe that the financial crisis was um, was responsible for um, the bankruptcy of the Lehman Brothers. I believe it was because of inv uh, um, invalid uh, um, um, uh, objects. Uh, so uh, invalidated invariants. And if I am to predict the future a little bit, I might not be good at that, but if I would be predict um, the future, then probably broken invariants are also a reason for the fall of mankind. And if I go to a far few, uh, further future or far, farther away future, then probably broken invariants are also the reason for the rise of the empire. I'm almost certain about that because in 2014, we already got the right message. So both John Kaup and his friend Yoda tried us to tell that there is no try. Good code is easy to understand and is not about fiddling with all the details. And this is exactly what is happening in this function. Despite the fact that this assignment operator is only about 10 functions long, it is just too difficult to really comprehend. We're dealing with virtually everything. We are dealing with memory management. There is a new, there's a delete. We're dealing with pointers. Yeah, so there is dangling pointers involved. There's null pointers involved. Um, we are dealing with all different uh, kinds of data members, yeah? all of them um, in, in, in a row. We're dealing with self-assignment. It's just too much. There is, however, very, very good advice on how to deal with this kind of thing. Delegate. So first of all, this function is what we say is exception unsafe. So right now, this code gives us no guarantees whatsoever with respect to invariance and resources. There is a simple fix now. A simple fix would be to move the else branch, so this, this line of code here, to line 25. In case we do that, actually we have saved the day. Because if either new or the uh, constructor of resource uh, fail, um, we're still in a good shape. I said that it is perfectly okay if the resource pointer is a null pointer. Um, so this is potentially okay, but it might not be the old state because I've already changed in line 22, the integer and in line 23, the string. Still, this is what we refer to as the basic exception safety guarantee. Essentially means we are in good shape. Yes, there was a problem, there was an exception, but still we can deal with the problem. Um, uh, we we, we have st are still in good shape. We have somehow dealt with the problem locally. No resources leaked, invariants are preserved. But I would still rate this as bad code because still it is just too many details that I'm trying to uh, deal with manually. So as I said before, the right solution is to delegate. Instead of dealing with all of this memory management manually, what I should do really is to use a unique pointer in this example. So I have a unique pointer here as a data member now. I use make unique in the, in the constructor, and I'm also using make unique here in this line. And suddenly, a lot of the complexity that we've seen before is simply gone. We do no longer have to delete you do no longer have to call new manually. It's all handled automatically, reliably. True, we did not uh, go beyond the basic exception safety guarantee yet, but still, it feels and it looks better. We take a look at this code now and we have a much better understanding of what is happening. What I'm using here is just the basic philosophy of the C++ programming language. What I'm using here is RI. Resource acquisition is initialization. And I will not talk a lot about RAI at this point because also here there has been a very good back to basics talk last year at CPPCon 2019. So Arthur Otwai talked about RAI and the rule of zero. And this is a talk that definitely every C++ programmer should have seen or every C++ programmer at least should have understood the full extension, the full extents of uh, what RAI truly means. There is no resource leaks in C++ if you truly follow um, this, this guideline. Or, to put it into John Kalb's words, keep your resources on a short leash. Do not go leaking wherever they want. 
Yeah, indeed. Um, Rai is helping you a lot with um, resources, but that makes your code much easier, to some extent, automatically exception saved. So it will not always work. Still, um, this is a very first step to go there. Still, we can now, although we are pretty happy already, perhaps, we can still try to reason about this one more time. Because still, whatever happens in make unique might fail. We still call new inside this function. We still call the constructor of resource. It might throw an exception. However, perhaps we can take a closer look at what we're doing in this function. We're copying the int, we're copying the string. We are copying a resource. Isn't this something that I'm also dealing with in the copy constructor? Isn't this exactly the same piece of code? Actually, it is. And for that reason, we can actually go one step further and apply something that um, yeah, most strongly follows the advice that I've given you before, delegate. Instead of coding this again, to some extent violate the dry principle, we could simply call the copy constructor. So now in this function, we have dealt with all of these operations. If indeed this line here, line 14 fails, nothing bad happened. Actually, it just failed to create a copy, which is nice. So this line is the one line that might actually fail. If I now can make the content of temp my own without any possibility of this operation to fail, then I actually would be done. And there's a very elegant way to do that. The most common one used today is to simply move this temporary into this. In other words, to use the move assignment operator. That is called the temporary move idiom. And it works, hopefully, because your move assignment operator, if everything is implemented as expected, should actually be a no accept operation. An operation that promises that it will not fail. So if I experience an exception in this line of code, then actually nothing bad happened to this subject. I did not yet touch this state. This is great. This is what we refer to as the strong exception safety guarantee. Either everything, uh, everything works out or nothing is changed. Invariants are preserved, no resources leaked, perfect. But if this works, if I indeed get a full copy of W, uh, if I get this temporary, then I can move it without any um, possibility for any uh, kind of exception into myself. The temporary move idiom. And suddenly, a lot of the complexity is indeed gone. If you take a look at this function, we now simply argue this works. And of course, the move assignment operator implements something that we call is the, this no throw uh, exception safety guarantee. This operation will not fail. We heavily rely on that for implementing the strong exception safety guarantee. There is, in fact, a couple more functions that are not supposed to fail. So move just being one of them, the most prominent function that must not fail, should not fail, to weaken it a little bit, is the structures. The structures are an integral part of this entire game because they are called during stack unwinding. If a destructor could fail, if it could throw an exception during stack unwinding, when another exception is obviously already flying, then we would again fail completely. If you throw a second exception, meaning if indeed two or more exceptions are flying, then the standard terminate function is called again. And I said before, this is a not, not particularly pleasant thing to happen. Um, this is something you want to avoid. Because they're so important in terms of program correctness, exception safety in particular, they are, destructors are implicitly marked as no except in C11. So you can, of course, mark them yourself, but the compiler assumes that there are no except. If indeed you want the destructor to, th uh, to throw, then what you would have to do is to explicitly mark this as no except 
false. So cleanup must be safe. The second function I already mentioned, um, the move assignment operator, but of course there's also the move constructor. Move operations in general should be implemented such that they can promise not to fail by means of no accept. So there is even a core guideline uh, core guideline C66 that says make move operations no accept. There's very, very good reasons um, because usually the move operations should really be broken down into the most simple operations. Yeah? Copying pointers, copying integers, it should be simple. And even though it may be a little ex more expensive, every move operation can be made no accept. Yeah? Of course, it is your choice um, in, in special cases. And a third function that should always be no except, because it usually can be implemented in that way, is the swap function. Also, swap usually should be able to be implemented in terms of non-failing basic operations, like copying pointers, like copying integers, etc. Standard swap relies on move operations. And if the move operations do not uh, do what you expect, what you want, of course, you can implement your own swap. In that case, please remember that swap indeed should be uh, no accept. No accept has indeed a couple of benefits. So it is something that perhaps you want to look out. No accept, first of all, makes the promise to never throw visible, uh, throw, um, do not throw visible in the code. So you will definitely see in the code that something will not fail. And this is a good thing. You know, this definitely raises your, um, um, your confidence in this particular function. But it also can lead to, well, at least slightly faster code. It's not massively faster, but um, it has been shown that indeed the compiler has to produce a couple of less um, assembly statements. And of course, this may make a difference between a little faster and a little slower. Note that if you indeed mark a function with no accept and you still throw from this function, so an exception leaves this function, then again terminate is called. And unfortunately, the compiler does not really check this, um, this promise that you do not accept. This is something that compiler has never done before. Before C11, the compiler did not check any kind of exceptions. You're on your own here. So if you give the no accept um, promise, then make sure that it is true and make sure that you can also um, give this promise. The compiler will not help you. Which, however, also means that you should not uh, give the uh, uh, no accept promise lightly. So only give it if you're absolutely certain that this is actually true. And also um, do not give it if you later potentially might take it back. Because once a function is smart, there's no accept, people will rely on this promise. And later telling them, oh, by the way, it's not working that way anymore, is probably not a good idea. So there is few functions that should be marked with no accept. The obvious small functions, um, please don't overuse it, despite the fact that perhaps code is a little faster. So, and of course, I mentioned this before, destructors are implicitly marked as no accept. So back to this example, by means of this construct, we have now turned the function into something that we understand immediately. We can take a look at the function, we see it works. And I would argue this is just good code. Code that is comprehensible, code that the reader can pick up easily. And so even if exceptions are not your thing, this is still something that is interesting from a structural point of view. This code is just properly structured. And so if you implement your code in this particular fashion, then you might in the future, when you can turn on exceptions, um, you might actually have a big benefit. Note that when this is working, we can actually also um, completely get rid of this statement here. Um, Self-assignment will still work. It might be a little more expensive, but still it works. And so this is exactly what John Kalb meant with his promise. The code it becomes easier to read, easier to write. There's not nothing special that we're doing. We've done the same thing before, and it is 100% robust. 
So, a couple of guidelines. Rye is the single most important idiom of the C++ programming language. Use it. All functions should at least provide the basic exception safety guarantee, if possible, and reasonable, the strong guarantee. And consider another guarantee, but only provide it if you can guarantee it, even for possible future changes. All right. Um, there is a perhaps interesting side question, how to deal with failing cleanup functions. What if, for instance, a destructor calls something that could potentially fail? So, for instance, um, let's assume that we have a file that has been opened somewhere in the constructor probably, but now that has been to be closed in the destructor. Well, F close actually can fail. It's not that obvious, but it will return an error code. What if I want to deal with this problem somehow? Well, then the best advice I can give you is that you do not rely on std uh, fstream or um, so ifstream or ofstream, because in this case, they simply ignore the problem. If you want to react on this particular problem, then you would have to write your own write class. In the destructor, you would now accept this error code, check it, and deal with it somehow, but you still cannot throw, you should not throw. You don't know what you could do, but still it's not a particularly good idea. It will trigger too many other problems. So, um, for handling errors in the destructor differently, write your own write classes that um, manage this in the way you want to deal with it. Now, there is perhaps one more information that I want to give you, something that is always something that I also deal with in my, uh, my training classes, how to refactor code that just isn't there yet. How can I get to code that is exception safe, that is beautiful to use? Um, what, you do, what, what do you have to do? Well, basically we are now talking about the transition from pre-exception safe to exception safe code. Um, so, this is, um, we're dealing with code that cannot really deal with exceptions at this point. And there is one law, one rule, I would say, um, not just as strong from a wording point of view. Um, there is Jean Perrin's iron law of legacy refactoring. Existing contracts cannot be broken. So what does this mean? Of course you should refactor, but you should not make the old functions suddenly throw exceptions. All new code that you write can be exception safe, can be written in the way um, that I basically now just um, talked about. On new interfaces, of course, free to throw um, as well. Yeah. However, if you have some old function, you cannot just leave exception, uh, let uh, this, this old function throw exceptions now. Nobody would expect it. And it would, of course, very ungracefully disrupt uh, a lot of things. So you have to basically write new functions and re-implement the old function in terms of the, of the new one. So in order to give you an idea how this works, let's take a look at an example. It's not a particularly difficult example. It's a rather short example, something that um, gives you an idea what I have in mind here. It's a function that loads a file. So, I'm loading a file. I have in this class some um, member that tells me from which file, and everything that I load is written into this byte stream. This implementation now uses error codes. And I should say, this is actually a nice way to use error codes. It's, it's still easy to understand. It deals with everything properly. This is okay. So, um, I first of all open the file with some um, things. So. The details are not so important. I open it, and if this fails, well, no problem. I return that there was an error. If this was okay, though, I first query the size, which might fail. If this, however, failed, I simply close the file and on. Um, and if this works, I really do, do the, the reading. It's more about the structure now. It's not about the details. Now, you can refactor this very, very elegantly. You just have to also, first of all, rework file. Because file, as long as it works with error codes, will not really work. 
So let's assume that file has been restructured following these right principles. Now the constructor opens, um, the file withdraws an exception. Of course, the destructor calls close when necessary. Get size and read. These two functions also throw an on error and um, return whatever is expected. If you do that, then the function suddenly might look like this. You open the file. If this doesn't work, nothing bad happens. But if it works, I can continue to deal with the byte stream. The byte stream might, the constructor might fail, but then file is cleaned up, everything's okay again. And if this works, I can read and so on. I do not have to explicitly deal with errors anymore. Note that this function is now called differently. It has also different semantics. It gets a file name as a parameter, it returns a byte stream. I changed a lot, but this might be the function that I need. And that here is the old function. The old function that uh, I called before, um, this function is now implemented in terms of the new one. I embed the new function in a try catch block and simply return what I returned before, true in the case of um, success, false in the case of an error. Now it, is the same code, but suddenly it's so much nicer to read, so much nicer to, to deal with. All right. And so, yes, you can indeed deal with this, uh, with these steps, even in a large code base, because usually you deal with this in small bytes. It should be part of regular maintenance, and the big code base is never at risk. You can actually deal with this locally. So, and again, I point out this is exactly what John Kaup meant with his promise. Code just becomes more beautiful, more readable. So I hope that this was reasonable, gave you a reasonable idea of how to work with exceptions, but also that a lot of the problems that we have ex with exceptions are not really about exceptions, but about the code that is surrounding the exceptions. But writing better code, dealing with exceptions actually becomes easier. So thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm happy to take a couple of questions um, if there's time left. All right, so there is a question. Um, can you re-explain potentially slices the exception under the topic of catching exceptions by recipients? So potentially slices. Let me see if I can really quickly go back to this slide. That might make it a little easier. Um, so here we are. So potentially slices. If you throw an exception object itself, it's not sliced, but as soon as you have anything that is deriving from exception, it will definitely be sliced. Um, so it entirely depends on what you actually throw and what you expect. In case you catch that exception, I would guess that this de really deals, uh, that this really causes slicing. But if you throw something different and you expect it in exactly that form, it is just copied unnecessarily. It is not necessarily sliced. It entirely depends on this combination. Okay, second question. In an embedded system that is multi-process and multi-threaded, is it workable to allow exceptions in any process without real-time deadlines and restrict in process with real-time and restrict in process with real-time deadlines? Okay, this is definitely a great question, uh, <laughs> a longer answer. However, this is perfect for the uh, subsequent AMA section. And so I clearly invite you to just post a question again. Um, probably I don't have enough time to answer this in detail now, um, which means I'm going to slide 78. Let me quickly go there. Um, for the third question, how does the use of make unique handle disallocating the memory and then allocating again in the copy constructor and copy assignment operator? So make unique is um, essentially just calling new. It is a wrapper around new, which is fairly convenient because indeed in this code, code you never have to deal with new or delete yourself. In case, however, um, anything happens during this new and the subsequent um, constructor, there's never an object that is created. Make unique fails, 
completely and there's never any result. It never returns me something uh, that has been created because nothing has been created. And so it's not really a problem for me. There is no responsibility that I need to take care of. Um, and so there is not no problem with disallocating anything. Perhaps there's one more detail to the story. Um, if new indeed allocates and then the, the uh, construct of resource fails, then the new promises us to also deallocate again. So I never get a pointer. I would not be in a position to uh, free the, the, this resource um, because I did not really get the pointer. Yeah? Nothing was assigned to PR. Uh, so I, I wouldn't have a chance anyway. New takes care of this, it rolls back uh, the memory allocation on its own. Uh, so there is a difference between the new expression and operator new. This is something that um, is important here. All right. I think that's the end of the question, please, uh, of this session. Please, um, if you have a couple of questions that you really want to be answered, please just stay in this room. Um, there is a subsequent AMA session. You're quite invited to, to put, put, participate there. Um, else, thanks a lot for attending. I hope this was useful uh, for you. Thank you very much.